Okay, everybody, how are you doing this morning? Awesome, great, I'm so glad you guys could be here with us today. Uh, there are so many superlatives about today that I can't even begin to, uh, to describe. We have some amazing speakers today for you, uh, some of the best and brightest regarding the subject of Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, some of the best medical doctors, some of the best emotional caregivers, and we have some very special people here to share with you some of their personal stories. So I would like, if you would, when they come up, give them a really big happy and a, a welcome greeting to them, as well as when they're done, give them a, a, a nice send off as well. Now, today's presentation is going to be very tight. We're going to be having speaker after speaker after speaker. It's about, each one is going to be speaking for about 20 minutes. Uh, they're going to be kept to a very tight time frame because we want to keep it very, very succinct and powerful for you. My name is Sean Scott. I'm going to be your first presenter today. I am an elder law attorney. I've been practicing elder law for the last 24 years. Uh, elder law is basically focusing on the legal needs of an aging population. Today's subject dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia obviously comes into my realm and into my field of practice on a daily basis. I have seen thousands and thousands of families go through this disease process. It is something that uh, has, has made an incredible impact on my life. It's, our, it's my mission in order to help these people through that process. So the title of my presentation today is Planning for Alzheimer's. Planning for Alzheimer's is like planning for a tsunami. Okay, I don't know if you've seen some of the pictures from Japan, but it, they, they strike me as amazing when that tsunami came in. There's these people driving down the road like nothing's happening, and all of a sudden, houses and this wave is coming up the road. And they put on their little brakes, and they go, and you can almost see, oh my gosh, what is going on with that? They do a little three-point turn, and they head the other way as fast as they possibly can. That tsunami is a direct metaphor for the Alzheimer's experience for many of my clients. They're not expecting anything coming, they're, they're driving down the road, and all of a sudden this huge wave of change comes upon them. Planning for that process, planning for that disease process, planning for that experience, planning for that journey is what I'd like to help you with today. There are a lot of things that you can do to plan for it, uh, in much like the tsunami metaphor, uh, you might want to go to high ground, you might want to anticipate that the problem may be coming. I don't know if you want to be the guy doing the three-point turn in the, fr in the front of the wave. But if that's the case, that's also something that you can deal with. When it comes to planning, from my perspective as, uh, as, as a lawyer serving this particular uh, population, there's broken down into three main areas. These three main, er main areas are something that everybody must uh, deal with and address. The first area we talk about is incapacity planning. Obviously, with this issue of getting older and running into this disease process, the issue of incapacity is one that is going to need to be met. We want to we address that as soon as possible. We do not want to wait till the Alzheimer's train has left the station and we're on our way uh, uh, through the dementia process, if at all possible. First and foremost, address the incapacity problem. Very simple to do. You need to have some sort of document in place. We often refer to it as a durable power of attorney, which will allow you to appoint somebody to act on your behalf. I often refer to it with my clients as a co-pilot. You need a co-pilot for yourself or for the person that you're caring for. Without the ability to fly this metaphorical plane for uh, and on behalf of that other person, your ability to help them and to prepare for the future is dr dramatically and severely limited. You're not just tying one hand behind your back, you're probably tying both hands behind your back. So one thing, first and foremost, whenever you're dealing with this issue, after you get a diagnosis, if you are believe that you are running through this particular dementia issue, one of the first things that are on your list is to address the issue of incapacity and get a durable power of attorney in place. Now, I often get asked by my clients, they say, well, Sean, gee whiz, I already have a diagnosis for my husband, my brother, my son, uh, anyone. Uh, is it too late to get this in place? And the answer to that question is absolutely not. Uh, you can do it at any time as long as that person still has capacity. And that's the tricky bit. If you wait too long in this process, if you wait too long for that Alzheimer's train or dementia train to go down the tracks, you will reach a point where legally you can't get that document in place any longer. The point here, however, is just because you have a diagnosis does not mean that you cannot get one of these documents in place. 
Now, we're going to have some speakers today from, uh, from USF Health, uh, from uh, the uh, Bird Institute out at the University of South Florida. We've done some innovative work with them in that we've put a virtual law office into, their, uh, in, uh, uh, into the Bird Center. Uh, in order to be able to meet with clients virtually to get these kinds of documents in place. It is that important to us that, w that these things are there. Also related to the incapacity situation is the issue of health care. Uh, as a person progresses through the dementia and, through the and losing the ability to take care of themselves and make their own decisions, you need to have something in place which will allow them or allow you to make their health care decisions for them, including that ultimate decision. The unfortunate reality of this disease process is that at some point in time, uh, it, it will be terminal. And because of that, you need to have uh, some sort of document in your hand which allows you to make the ultimate decisions for these people as they lose the ability to decide for themselves. Oftentimes, it's referred to as a living will. Uh, in my office, I combine the living will with a healthcare surrogate designation. What a healthcare surrogate designation is is effectively a health uh, a healthcare power of attorney second thing you need for incapacity planning. Very, very important. These are basic things that many of you may already know, but they're so incredible and fundamental to dealing with the issues that you're going to face that I have to address them today. Another issue that we deal with in the scope of um, planning for Alzheimer's from a legal perspective is dealing with the issue of what I often refer to as mortality planning. Planning for the eventual uh, mortality of all of us especially, not necessarily, the person that is, uh, with, has the disease, but for the caregiver of that person. In many cases, that person will be a spouse. And one of the most overlooked things that I deal with uh, and I see in my, in my practice is that we're so focused on caregiving, we're so focused being in the moment and providing the care for that individual that a lot of things kind of fall off and fall off the side of the road. And one of those things is the estate plan of the healthier spouse. Now, I always joke with my clients, I say, I guess there's at least a 50-50 chance that you may die before your spouse dies. If you think about that, that's probably statistically accurate. When you look at the situation, though, and you actually look at the numbers and the research shows that the caregiver is more likely to pass away before the person being cared for. So it makes it even doubly more important that we address the issue of what is that estate plan for, uh, for the caregiver look like. So often caregivers have uh, state plans, the uh, will, or some sort of joint ownership with their assets, where what we have in this situation is Honey, if I die, you get everything. And the other one says, if I die, honey, you get everything. We call those the I love you wills. Great when both of you are in the same situation as far as your health is concerned, you're on kind of the same level. Not so great when we're talking about one person dealing with dementia and the other one as the caregiver. Probably the last thing that we want to have happen in that situation is for the person who, uh, the, the caregiver, to pass or die and leave all of their assets, all of that accumulated wealth of that couple, to the person who has dementia. And when I say this to people, they have a little light bulb oftentimes goes on in their head and they go, oh, I never thought of that. So one of the things I want you to think about today is what would happen if all of the assets, all of, the, all of your accumulated wealth, were to land into the lap of the person with dementia. First of all, we'd have a problem with being able to manage and control those assets, obviously. And secondly, it would dramatically impair their ability to acquire health care benefits to help take care of them as they go through this process of, uh, uh, of dementia. And that's where I want to take us next, is how to take care of somebody with dementia after you have run out of steam. From a caregiver's perspective, I often tell a story of this Greek myth. Uh, his, uh, it was called, it's a story about Sisyphus. That's an interesting name, Sisyphus. And I modify the story a little bit. This poor Sisyphus guy, he had to roll a rock up this hill. He was, he was punished by the Greek gods to roll this rock up the hill. And when he got to the top of the hill, the rock would roll all the way back down. He'd have to go back again and push it up the hill. I modify the story a little bit, and I make the rock never stop going up the hill. In this particular story, the rock is representing the, the person you're taking care of. You as a caregiver start out at the bottom of that hill. You're young, you're healthy, you're vibrant, you're, you're ready to take care of this problem. You got everything in the world, and the problem's not so big. 
and you start rolling that rock up the hill. And a year go by, and a couple more years go by. The rock gets bigger. You get weaker. The hill gets steeper. And at some point in time in that journey, you get to the point where you can't roll the rock any further. You get that rock to that point where all you can do is just hold that rock. And your arms are shaking, and you're doing everything you can do to provide that care for that individual. And it's taking everything that you have. And what happens next? The rock rolls back over you and goes all the way to the bottom of the hill. That's not an outcome that we're looking for. So at some point in this journey, you may reach the point where you cannot push that rock any longer, despite everything that you want to do, despite every part of you that wants to continue in that role as a primary caregiver, you're not going to be able to do it. And I encourage you to recognize that moment. And when you recognize that moment, have a plan in place where you can step aside from the rock and have somebody else continue to push that, continue to provide that care for you. This is not giving up. This is merely stepping aside and watching and helping and seeing and guiding that rock as it goes up the hill, continuing to provide that care, but not being the person trying to push it yourself. When you reach that situation, you're going to be looking at one of two different outside sources to provide that care. It's either going to be from an assisted living facility or from a nursing home, depending upon how far you've gone in that, in that journey as a caregiver. Both of these solutions, unfortunately, have a financial cost associated with them. And that financial cost associated with them needs to be met in some way. Now, when we focus on the nursing home, which is the, the, the most intensive level of care, we find we have a very, very significant financial, uh, financial problem. Now, across the country here, uh, the range of care can go, uh, cost of care can go anywhere from $7,000 a month to $14,000 a month, literally doubling. Probably the most expensive place to uh, provide care is in the state of New York and the state of California. In the state of Florida, where we're at and where we're located today, the average cost of care in our community is going to run about $9,000 a month. For just about every single one of us, that additional bill, on top of all of our other financial obligations, really equals a financial catastrophe for the family. It creates a problem that many of you have uh, probably heard of called negative cash flow. You got more going out than you got coming in, okay? And when you reach that negative cash flow situation, it is just a mathematical equation to how long it's going to take you to get to zero. My job for the last 24 years has been to avoid that problem for families. Now, unfortunately, the way our healthcare system is set up in our country, uh, it does not adequately provide for care for people with Alzheimer's disease or, in, or other related dementias. Uh, very interestingly, there is a, a, almost a discrimination in, inherent in our system based upon which disease that you get as you age. Interestingly enough, I think this is the first place or the first time when getting cancer is probably a good thing. Because you see, if you get cancer under our healthcare system as it exists today, Medicare will come in and pay for all of the treatment that you as a senior will, 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 will need. It'll pay for your doctor visits, it'll pay for your therapies, your chemotherapy, your medications. It'll pay for, in essence, all of that. And contracting or coming down with cancer is not going to wipe you out financially. However, coming down with Alzheimer's or some other dementia, pulling that card out of the disease pile will result in financial catastrophe because there is no coverage under, now let me preface that, no adequate coverage under Medicare to pay for the cost of that person's needs, that medical care for that individual. The unfortunate reality of Alzheimer's is many times it's, we don't have a lot that we can do to make that person healthier, it's maintaining that person's health as long as possible. And then the setting of a nursing home, Medicare does not pay for the cost of that care beyond a maximum of 100 days and only under very limited circumstances will they even pay for that. So what are you going to do when you have to step away from the rock and seek that kind of care financially? Think about that for a second. Are you going to let that tsunami, that financial tsunami that, that this is representing, roll over you and wipe you out? You do not have to do that. 
In our office, we have an interesting, uh, we call that particular strategy the do-nothing plan. If you do nothing about this situation and you stand there and you wait for the wave just to take you and to bring you down financially to zero, eventually you can qualify for health care benefits to pay for the cost of that care. Now that health care benefit that you would qualify for is called Medicaid. We have a distinction here between Medicare and Medicaid. When we're looking at providing long-term care, really the only game in town in order to pay for that care, unfortunately in our health care system as it exists today, is seeking eligibility for Medicaid benefits. That's about as simple as I can make it. The word Medicaid needs to be a new word in your vocabulary. You need to educate yourself regarding what Medicaid is all about. And you need to take a couple things with you from today that regardless of where you stand financially at this moment, whether wh whatever your income is, whatever your asset level is, that you can qualify for Medicaid to pay for the cost of that care. Now I go into great length and longer presentations on exactly how to do this, and from today's perspective, I wanna leave you with that real simple point that regardless of where you stand at this moment, you can qualify for this healthcare benefit program to pay for the cost of that care and not run into financial ruin and equalize our healthcare system so that there is no difference between Medicare and Medicaid. There is no difference between whether you get cancer or you have Alzheimer's or some other related dementia. That you can be treated equally and we can level the playing field. Again, it's an unfortunate reality. I wish we didn't have to talk about Medicaid. I wish our system provided better care for us and supplied that in a way that we could all afford. However, that's not the case. So with today's presentation, today's planning for this, it's something that you can't necessarily predict. Sometimes you do have some advanced warning. If you have any advanced warning, you need to take immediate action. Looking at the situation of planning for incapacity, dealing with the issue of mortality, making sure we don't have any surprises, and beginning the process of accessing those Medicaid benefits. The more time that you have ahead of you to plan for that eventuality, the easier and more effective I can be in solving that particular problem. So for today's purposes, I want to thank you for listening to me today. We're going to be bringing up some amazing speakers in just one moment. Uh, we have many people from, uh, uh, from USF, some of fantastic leading edge researchers, scientists, and doctors. And we also have some surprise guests for you that will share with uh, their personal stories regarding this disease process. So thank you very much.